Tonight on Let It Rip. We do not need people entering our subways, our restaurants, our movie theaters with concealed weapons. We don't need more guns on our streets. As the U.S. Senate debates the first major gun control legislation in decades, the Supreme Court hands Second Amendment supporters a big victory. Plus, should Detroit give another big tax break to billionaire Dan Gilbert? But first... The issue is we have taken God out of the culture, we've taken God out of the classroom, and we've taken God out of the courtroom. He's a longtime pastor who's now entering the political arena. Reverend Ralph Reban tells us why he deserves your vote in the gubernatorial primary. Time now to let it rip tonight. We're once again joined by one of the candidates hoping to be the next governor of Michigan. For the last 25 years, Reverend Ralph Rebant has been the lead pastor for the Oakland Hills Community Church in Farmington Hills. He's also been a chaplain for several area police agencies and even an advisor to former Governor Angler. And now he wants your vote for the state's top job, and he's running as a Republican. Reverend, we thank you for joining us today. Charlie Langton, of course, with us as well, our legal analyst and anchor and, of course, co-host of Let It Rip. Let's talk for a moment about uh, your chances here, Reverend. Reverend, uh, you, you've, you've seen the numbers. I talked to Perry Johnson today. He says no one seems to be polling even close to 10% right now. How hopeful do you feel that you have a shot at this? I'm extremely hopeful. I've been running in lanes uh, throughout the state of Michigan for the last year. And everywhere we go, our message is resonating with people all over the state. Uh, it doesn't matter if they're in Wayne County or Detroit or whether they're up in Marquette. Our message is really resonating. And the interesting thing is that as you look at the polling, um, it, the, every article that I've read says 47 to 49% of uh, likely voters still haven't made up their mind. And so I, I'm just, I'm really excited. I, I really believe I'm going to win this thing. Well, you're, you're a true conservative on many levels, both socially, also fiscally. I mean, there's no surprise, no shock about that. Uh, you're a reverend. You, you wear your, your faith on your sleeves. When you head into, for instance, Detroit, into a heavy Democratic area, does your message resonate with the people you're talking to in Detroit among African-Americans, for instance? It really, really does. In fact, when I was at the TCF Center the day after the election, as I was walking around the, uh, the counting tables, uh, I just started asking people at the tables what, uh, if, and I didn't tell them I was running for governor, but I said, if there were some things you could change about Michigan, what would it be? And many of the people, the African-Americans at those tables said, bring God back into culture. And I was just elated to know that they had been so excited to, uh, to, to have the same vision I had, and I hadn't even announced it yet. Charlie, you've been hitting the streets talking to people every single day about what their thoughts are, what their feelings are. If, if someone's going to beat Governor Gretchen Whitmer, what is their strategy going to be? And, and do you think this reverend uh, can manage to do that? Well, I think, I think, you know, just looking at the numbers, I mean, I think we'd all agree it's an uphill battle. But nevertheless, I looked at his uh, website, and Reverend uh, Ralph, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, but it looked like your number one priority would be to talk about election fraud. And as I understand it, there have been numerous court cases filed in pretty much every state, and pretty much every single judge has thrown these cases out. Is, first of all, is election fraud really the number one issue? And if it is... What can you do as governor that all of these judges couldn't do? Sure. Um, I wouldn't say election fraud is the number one issue. What I would say, though, is that we have a moral collapse in our society. And because of that, it doesn't matter which issue we're dealing with, whether it's people who might lie, whether, regardless of what side they're on, to uh, try to maintain their power and uh, their leadership, or I would call lack of leadership if they're out there lying, but that would be the biggest issue, Charlie, that I would see, this, this lack of moral leadership. In fact, as you look at my website, you're going to see that I have what's called a lighthouse initiative, which involves four words, in God we trust, four values that I believe everybody, regardless of their religion, desires, and that's truth, respect, dignity, and love, and of course, my four strategies and my four solutions. So though election integrity is important to me, because if we... Uh, lose that reality. If we lose the sanctity of our elections, we're going to lose our country. Are you advocating, so prayer, in public, are you advocating prayer in public schools? Uh, I would not have a problem with prayer in public schools. I, our nation had that um, back in the day. Uh, we, we really need to bring back our Judeo-Christian principles. And people are realizing that because we've abandoned those, we are where we are today. 
Well, Reverend, I got to ask you about abortion because uh, we know right now that Representative Steve Kara's bill is to punish abortion essentially by uh, by giving ten year prison sentences to doctors. Do you agree with that? Well, if people break the law, they should be punished for that. And as it as we talk about abortion, I have not seen that particular version of it. Though I have talked with Steve Kara on and the team on the issue of abortion and uh, personhood from conception. I, I haven't seen that particular part of the law. But, but what are your thoughts, people, Reverend, on, on, on a bill that would essentially punish abortion, uh, 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 doctors, I should say, uh, with a 10-year prison sentence? Is that, is that harsh? Is that in line with the, the kind of uh, legislation that you think should be out there? I don't think it's too harsh. And here's the reason why. If people kill a, an eagle, an American eagle, it's five years and $50, 000, or $250,000 prison sentence. If they talk about uh, destroying a nest and there's nothing in it, it's the same fine. So we're talking about human beings in the womb. And so the, the punishment has to be high enough that no one will want to perform that. Well, how can so you claim I, you support bodily autonomy and not think women have a choice on abortion, but we're talking about vaccines and the vaccine mandate. We know where you stand on that. Don't you think those two kind of butt heads? I don't think they do at all because the issue is the child within the woman is a separate child. Science, science proves that. Uh, you know, whether it's a DNA test and the, and the child in the womb has a different DNA than the mother and oftentimes a different blood type, uh, it, it's really clear from science that that is not the woman's body, but rather that's a human being inside. So if, if, I, if I may, let's assume under your leadership, uh, a woman gets pregnant. They can't have an abortion because no doctor's going to do it and risk 10 years in prison. So they're going to have that child. But let's assume that they can't afford that child. Would you be okay increasing welfare benefits to that child and that family so that they can raise the child? You know, that, that's a great question, Charlie. And what I have been saying on the campaign trail and what I've actually seen with my own eyes is there's a group out there called One Life for Life. And what they do is they stand out in front of abortion clinics. And when a woman comes up to get an abortion, they tell these women, we will pay for the first three years of that child. We will pay for diapers. We will pay for clothes. And all of these things that make it uh, make, that would be necessary for this child to live and these faith-based organizations are really coming to the forefront. And that's where, you know, as a governor, as a pastor, someone who has compassion for people at some of the most difficult times of their life, that's where we have to come beside them and help them. And so to answer your question, I don't see government and welfare as being the solution. I see rather faith-based organizations and pastors and people coming be beside those gals and even couples, families who are, are struggling financially. And our church personally did that over the, the 35 years that I was ministering uh, in our church. We helped out low-income people. We helped people that were in Detroit, in Brightmoor, uh, because they couldn't make it. And some of those people went from being on welfare to self-sustaining with our help. Reverend, when you hear when you hear you talk about Judeo-Christian values and how those need to return, uh, do you do you are you afraid in any part of you at all that that kind of uh, pushing that onto a very diverse population here in Southeast Michigan could hurt your chances as you uh, constantly talk about those values and perhaps God? Do you think maybe that's isolating some voters? I, I don't think that it will, Root, because when you look at what I've stood for my whole life in ministry. I've never once twisted somebody's arm to, to trust in Christ. I've never once uh, uh, left somebody behind who didn't. I've always been a friend to everyone, regardless of their faith, regardless of their nationality, regardless of their own sexual orientation. And in fact, the reality is as we uh, help people and as they understand the foundation of our country, founded upon Judeo-Christian Judeo principles, it, in, in my life and in our country's history, it is that First Amendment that gives people the right to worship whoever they want or not worship at all. Or if they want to worship a tree, they can do that. You know, you as I tell governor, people, I'm not running for the, the, uh, the judge of the yeah. universe. I'm running for the governor of Michigan. And I want to see us get back on track. And the best way to make that happen is simply by bringing back our nation's history. And when you look at our nation's history, 
we weren't founded on Buddha's, uh, Buddhist theology. We weren't founded on Confucius or even Islam. We were founded on Judeo-Christian principles. And those Judeo-Christian principles are clearly outlined in our constitution and even our birth certificate, the Declaration of Independence. But this country certainly has evolved and changed in 300 years, and many other ideas have become part of that mosaic, wouldn't you say? Uh, well, they've become part of it uh, because we, we love people, and that's, that's my point. With reference to my four values, remember I mentioned truth, respect, dignity, and love. I don't know any religion or any person who's irreligious or has no religion at all who would not appreciate those four values. And so that's what I'm running on. I'm not running on making America a theocracy. Uh, our founders never intended uh, that to take place. They saw an institutional separation from uh, the government, church and state. And you know, the interesting thing is many Democrats agree with what I just said, many of them. Would you sign a, uh, Ralph, would you sign a bill that came to your desk that would expand Elliot Larson civil rights to include those uh, for sexual orientation and gender identity. And if you would, would you put someone in your cabinet, a leadership position in your administration who happened to have uh, to be gay, for example? You know, I, I, to answer that specifically, I would not expand Elliot Larson. I would not do that at all because I would side with uh, Chief Roberts, Scalia, and Thomas on that, uh, on that uh, 2015 uh, Supreme Court decision who said that uh, the, not only does the Supreme Court not have the right to make laws, they simply interpret them, but that landmark decision that was five to four demonstrates that we have now gone from uh, God-given rights to what the Supreme Court is establishing as rights. And so that's what you, Thomas so you, Scalia and Robert well, Reverend, said. Reverend and Charlie, we, we want to continue the conversation with the Reverend. We want to include our panel as well. We have a lot more to get to, and we're going to include Reverend Ralph Rebent, Republican candidate for governor, in that discussion. And welcome back to Let It Rip, as promised. Reverend Ralph Rebent has joined us in the mix with our political panel, which is comprised of fellow conservative and attorney Terry Johnson, co-host of the No BS News Hour and Detroit News columnist Karen Dumas, plus another candidate running for office tonight, John Conyers. He's, of course, the son of the late Congressman John Conyers and former city council president Monica Conyers. And he's asking for your vote in Michigan's 13th congressional district, facing multiple opponents in the Democratic primary. And, of course, Charlie is back, and we thank you all for joining us. We're going to kick things off with billionaire Dan Gilbert asking Detroit City Council for another $60 million tax break for the Hudson site project. Uh, Karen, in your Detroit News column this week, you basically said, look, this is a terrible idea. Why do you think it's such a terrible idea? Well, you have to remember this property was acquired uh, in what, 2007? This is 2022. Dan Gilbert already has received $200 million in incentives and compensation and breaks for this development. We have not seen any blueprints. We don't know what the holdup is. I mean, it, it, there are a lot of unanswered questions. We don't know if he actually meets the criteria. There's no clawback. And we're not even really sure that he would qualify for this. Uh, I know everybody's like, oh, Dan Gilbert's done so much for the city. He is the largest property owner uh, in downtown Detroit. He's a business person. This has nothing to do with him being a billionaire. I mean, he didn't get this way by selling Girl Scout cookies. But we've got residents that were overtaxed by $600 million. And those residents were told, there's no money for you. We can't give you anything. We can't give you this money back. But yet and still, we're able to extend these 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 this this these incentives um, for a building that is really more nothing more than a plan and a promise at this point. But Karen, when, and we're going to get back to you in a minute. You know, I want to talk to John Conyers for a moment here and ask him what he thinks here. I mean, Dan Gilbert, yeah, he's a billionaire, and yeah, he's asking for the sixty million dollars in credits. Uh, the council is yet to decide on that. If you were sitting, uh, which of course you're not running for Detroit City Council, but if you were sitting uh, on the council right now, how would you vote on that? Well, you know, when we look at this, it, it's, it's a tax abatement. Uh, and it doesn't mean that we should necessarily automatically be against it. Um, the amount that he's asking for is frozen for 10 years. Um, and it's not taking money uh, away that we weren't all, that we were already going to get, right? So I think it's, it's important to bear that in mind. Uh, as it relates to the downtown development project, the money that is collected through taxes uh, in that project does not, it's a, it's a special property tax. Uh, so once that tax money is collected, it doesn't go for Ed. Uh, it goes into a separate bank, separate bank account uh, that is used for other development projects. 
So this development, the money he's asking for specifically, is a it's a unique uh, tax situation. Uh, what's important that we do, uh, what, it, what it is important that we do is that we make sure that our community agreements, should we give him this tax break, are strong to ensure that he's working with Detroit developers, Detroit contractors, and hiring Detroit employees. That's the, that's the critical component of this. Well, what about, what about some of the folks who showed up at the council meeting the last time? The whole reason the vote was delayed because there was enough people who showed up to say, hey, not a good idea, put the brakes on this. And one woman who's homeless said, wait a minute here, uh, he needs to pay his, pay his fair share. You think this is paying his fair share? Again, I want to reiterate, the money that is being collected from this, this, these, this tax abatement uh, is already, it wouldn't be going to Ed, it wouldn't be going to uh, our, our constituents, it's, it's it, our, our, our residents. It is, is specifically for the development of downtown. Um, and so two things can be true. It, sh it is true that all tax breaks um, are, tax, some tax breaks are not good. And that, he, that people who receive them should absolutely be held to account for how much good or what, what they bring to the table from getting this tax break. But- Karen, oh, go, go ahead, John. No, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was gonna say, Karen, you have 2,000 jobs uh, that would come into this building, permanent jobs, those people pay income tax. You have an additional 7,000 plus construction jobs. Those jobs fuel, of course, money right into the, the system as well. But, but, Is that good enough? But those are, those are all speculative. And I'm not saying that this could not be a good development. What I'm saying is, is that we're a city that's not positioned to constantly um, fuel something that's not really beneficial for the community at large. Now, I understand that, you know, it resonates. We've talked about investing in downtown and midtown, but that has not resonated into the neighborhoods. I mean, it has not. We have a city that is broke and that continues to be broken. And, you know, I just, I understand, you know, we've got allocations, but my issue isn't with Dan Gilbert for asking. You remember when he had an issue with the um, Brownfield tax credits, he went to Lansing and changed the law. My concern are the people that are making decisions on their behalf and not necessarily taking into consideration the residents with the same level of interest and fever that they are Dan Gilbert's interest. Let's talk about, let's switch some things up and talk about guns for a moment. I want to bring Terry into the fold here as a, cons oh, go ahead, Charlie, what were you saying? Well, I just want to say, I think it's important. I think John Conyers is absolutely right. Let's understand what we're talking about here. If the law wants to be changed to inc include incentives for investment in the neighborhoods, that's fine. This is a specific area of downtown where no money goes to schools and city services and libraries. This money, these tax incentives- but don't you think that there should be a degree of accountability, Charlie, in terms of him doing what he has said that he was going to promise to do? There is nothing in there. He can build a party store and still be compliant. He's investing $1.4 billion or something like that. Let the guy, let the guy do his If we don't do it, guys, if, if we don't do it here, Mr. Gilbert is going to take his money and go to that's Cleveland. That's a threat, Terry. That's, but that, that's, that's a threat, threat here. That's, that's a threat. threat. That's a threat. That's a threat. If it's not well, in the best interest of everybody involved, that's well, not. Oh, no deal is in the best interest You're like the really girl who doesn't really, really, really get a date. So, can, like, Karen, okay, can I get into this for a second? There's a lot of speculation. Let's hear what the Reverend has to say about this. Yeah, just one second. You know, as governor, if I was. I'm for the little guy. I have to tell you that. I, I have people and friends that live in Brightmore. They're living on $7,000 a year. And so I, if I was sitting on that city council, I would say, you know what, I, as much as I love Dan Gilbert and all the work that he's done for the development, we need to develop our inner cities. We need to develop not, not the inner city Detroit, but we need to develop our neighborhoods. We need to make sure that that my friends, my pastor friends who are in Detroit, that their neighbors, their friends are being cared for. And, you know, I don't think the city or the federal government or even Michigan's government should choose winners and losers. To me, this sounds like corporate welfare, and I would not be in favor of that. Let's, let's move on to guns. I want to talk about guns here for a moment. There's a lot going on on this front, and, you know, we could probably spend an hour talking about it. But we'll spend the next six or seven minutes doing so. I'll bring uh, Terry Johnson into the fold here. Terry, uh, this Bipartisan Safer Communities Act is what it's being called. This, this bill that right now could be passed by Saturday, the largest gun legislation bill that we've seen in decades. Uh, do you like it? Do you support it? Actually, I don't. Here, here's the problem we run into, okay? There's a shooting that happens. And the first thing we do is we blame, you know, everything on the firearm. Let me give a, just a brief history here. If you go back to what really happened in Texas, 
What truly happened is the police failed, okay? And it's not every police officer. In this case, these police officers failed their duties, and we're going to blame the guns. This is a gun grab, but this is where I have a problem. We talk about bipartisanship. Where's the compromise? And what do I mean by that? One side gets to take rights away from the other. What does the other side get? No one but can Jay, answer what, that. What, what rights are being taken away? They're talking, first of all, they're not just talking about taking guns and legislation about guns. This is about mental health. This is about school safety, dedicating more than $240 million over four years to help with the mental health of young people, like, by the way, Ethan Crumley in Oxford and others across the country. What's wrong with that? And why is it that right now Republicans, including Mitch McConnell, are giving a thumbs up to this? There must be a reason. Well, you know, again, it's, it's election year. We've got to go after those so-called independent votes. The biggest problem, and I listen, I agree mental health is an issue. But when you start talking red flag laws, when you start talking um, extra background checks and other things, what's, what are we getting in exchange for that? A lot of well, these laws are already on the books, Root, especially in Michigan. If I want to get someone committed, there's a way to do it on the mental health side. Let's Ralph, take Ralph. the guns away. Let's take the people and the guns and separate them. In other words, let's take the guns away from the people, not the people away from the guns. Ralph, you're, you're running for governor in this uh, great state of Michigan. Your thoughts on the bill that right now is floating around Washington. Is it enough? Uh, it's going in the wrong direction, guys. And the reason why is over 60 years, we have spent $22 trillion on social programs. And we are trying to solve a problem that we don't even, or we're trying to bring solutions that we don't really even know what the problem is. Guns haven't changed. They've, I have a 1955 Browning semi-automatic shotgun. And my point is simply this. People in Farmington Hills took their guns to school in the 1960s. Went, they put them in their lockers, then went hunting after school with their teachers. Contrast that with Uvalde, with Oxford, and you'll, you have to ask what's changed. And so, guys, I'm running on this, this truth. We've removed God from the classroom. We removed God from the courtroom. And we removed God from culture. It's a heart issue. And that's why I believe that as a candidate for governor, I have a unique perspective that can address the issues of the heart that no other candidate can do. John Conyers, I want to ask you what your thoughts are on the legislation that's floating through right now. Is it enough? Uh, no, I think, listen, um, you know, it's, it's, it's cute to hear about uh, the, the background checks and we're, we're trying to take people's guns. It's not a gun grab. Our country has a, has a mental health crisis. I mean, not a mental health crisis, a public health crisis as it relates to gun safety. Uh, it, 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 is, it oh. is at an all-time high. It, it's, it's atrocious. We have to do something about it. The majority of Americans are in support of stronger background checks, universal background checks. The majority of Americans are. So I don't understand the pushback. We already have what, what, that. what does the other side get, John? I mean, that's the question. One side wants one thing in a compromise, okay, and, and Ralph's going to be running, is running for governor. He's going to have to compromise. Democrats want something. Republicans want something. You meet in the middle. Where do the people who have these rights now, where do they come in? Where's the compromise to them? But, so Terry, isn't this a compromise already when you take a look at what Democrats gave up and what Republicans have given up? Don't you think that's what this is? What have Democrats given up? You still oh, have you your gun. Your gun. We're not oh, taking. We're, oh, we're not I, here I to still, take your so gun. So I still have my gun, and I should be thankful, even though you're adding more and more restrictions. We're not. You are. We're not taking your guns. We're making it more difficult for people who do not have guns to get them. But those. But why is that? Is the, and that's the problem. It's not the people who. It's the wrong people. You're we're going to allow, you to, like gonna allow myself. everyone on the oh, panel to come up with a couple final thoughts and come back after the break and present that to us. That's all the time we have for this panel. When we come Thursday, our own Charlie Lantern will be hosting the only debate happening on Thursday night with the five gubernatorial uh, candidates for the Republican race and governor. And we begin with Ralph Rebent with his final thoughts. Friends, I'm convinced that unless we get God right in this next election, nothing's going to matter. The gun issue is one of the heart, and we can fix the state by changing people's hearts. John Conyers, your final thoughts. Rube, thank you. Uh, in 2019, I lost two of my cousins uh, to gun violence. Were you to elect me to United States Congress, I would ensure that we pass stringent legislation to institute universal background checks. You can find everything about my campaign at ConyersForCongress.com. Thank you. That, that does it for this edition of Letter Rip. We thank all of you for joining us. Good night.